Good afternoon. Welcome to the Marin Coalition presentation, which we've entitled Challenges of Water Management in Marin. I'm Scott Pinsky. I'm the chair of the Marin Coalition. We're delighted you're able to join us. As most of you know, the Marin Coalition is an all volunteer nonprofit public affairs forum based here in Marin County. Uh, we welcome all viewers and invite you to become a member on our website. Uh, if you are not a member, or if you are a member who has uh, lapsed and uh, are no longer in good standing, we encourage you to go onto the website and uh, renew your subscription. All of your dollars support these presentations. And as I said, we're an all volunteer board. So all of your uh, contributions and uh, membership fees go toward uh, the, the programs that we present here. Uh, before we begin, I want to tell you about the last two programs that we have for this season. Uh, first, on May 18, at the new time of 6 p.m., we will be presenting three leaders from some of the most important uh, organizations here in Marin that work to save our Bay Area wildlife. Our speakers will be the leaders of the, Mar the Marine Mammal Center, Wild Care, and International Bird Rescue. Uh, located in Fairfield, and they will talk about the human-driven environmental and habitat challenges that cause animals in the wild to face injury, starvation, habitat loss, and abandonment. Our guests will be Jeff Bohm of the Marine Mammal Center, J.D. Bergeron of IBR, and Ellen Wazell of Wild Care. Very much looking forward to that program. And finally, we're pleased to announce that we will presenting, be presenting Congressman Jared Huffman on June 2nd to our audience for the first time. That will be at noon on Wednesday. Uh, Representative Huffman will give us his take on the state of affairs in our nation's capital, and we'll take your questions. We'll be sending out flyers on both of these programs uh, in the near future, and you can also find registration information on our website. As you probably know, you need to uh, register to uh, participate in the event. Uh, registration is fee free, but you go on the website and, and click the link. Uh, technical notes for today's program, uh, please send in any questions uh, for our presenters by clicking on the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of the Zoom tab. Uh, don't use the chat, please. Um, uh, it's inactivated, I think. And so the uh, question and answer Q&A button is what you want to be looking for. And also, if you would like to see a live transcript, uh, go to the bottom of your window and click start on live transcript and you can see uh, the subtitle function. Today's guests are facing a once in a generation challenge of water scarcity and we look forward to hearing their thoughts today on the crisis that we've, we've all just begun to experience. Ben Hornstein is the general manager of Marin Water, formerly MMWD. He has more than 30 years of experience in the water industry, including serving as the Director of Water for the City of Santa Rosa, the Director of Wastewater and Recycling at the East Bay Municipal Utility District. Mr. Hornstein has a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering, environmental engineering from Loyola Marymount University and uh, uh, pursued, I'm sorry, wrong line here, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering from the University of Florida and he pursued his graduate work in environmental studies from Loyola Marymount University and Vermont Law School. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of California and a certified water and wastewater operator. Our other presenter is Ryan Grizzo. He is the water conservation coordinator for the North Marin Water District. Along with the water conservation program, Ryan also oversees the public information and communications program. He has 24 years of experience in water conservation, working at the North Marin Water District and previously at Sonoma County Water Agency and Contra Costa Water District. Ryan has a Bachelor of Science degree in Natural Resource Management from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And it is my privilege to present our two guests. Uh, I believe Ben, uh, you were going to go first, followed by Ryan, if my understanding is correct. So take it away, gentlemen. Okay, I'll start um, sharing my screen. Can you see this? I do. Great, okay, I'll roll into this. I have a brief PowerPoint, then I believe Ryan will go and we'll have questions. Um, overview about marine water, where we are with the drought, 
the restrictions we've enacted, some conservation tips, incentives, and resources for our customers. As many folks know, Marin Municipal is the oldest municipal water district um, in California. We were chartered in 1912, serving a large part of the county, about 190,000 people. And we also have our watershed on Mount Tam, where about 75% of our water comes from. And we do a tremendous amount of work on the mountain to um, preserve and protect that um, ecosystem, that special environment there. Um, as I noted, all our water is locally sourced, 75% from the reservoirs and lakes on Mount Tam, and 25% we get from the Russian River system through our partnership with Sonoma County Water Agency. Um, we're fortunate really to have such high quality water and a local supply that's protected in um, a natural environment. The um, where we stand today um, is with the two consecutive dry years. 2020 was the second driest in 90 years and 20 inches of rain compared to on average well above 50. And current rainfall for this year is about 40% of average for the time. Over the last 16 months, if we combine these years together, um, that's the um, least runoff, the least rainfall that we've had in our 150 years of record. So this is certainly a historic drought that we're finding ourselves in. Currently our reservoir storage in our local supply is about 50%. And typically this time of year, we would see about 90% capacity, 90% full. So we're down with our numbers, 40,000 acre feet, just a system of measurement we use. Normally that'd be close to double on an average year. When we look at projections um, at this point, we don't expect much precipitation to come in through the summer. And this graph with the dashed lines, you can see they start to diverge and the green line would be great. We would have an average uh, rainfall precipitation year, which would really help this coming winter. Um, the orange line is if it were 25% of average and the blue dash line is 50%. Notably, the solid blue line shows the benefit of conservation. If we're able to get um, 40 plus percent of conservation during the next stretch, um, we'll definitely be in a better place and to be able to better withstand an extended drought. So it is all about, at this point, conservation. Um, this shows rainfall um, prior to this stretch. The drought of record was 76, 77. And the green is our current uh, rainfall year. And you can see it's tracking below 76 and 77. So again, a very historic um, place we find ourselves. Storage, we look back in our system going to 1984, that was following the drought in the 70s. We increased our storage with a new reservoir and raised the dam. Um, so since that time period, as of May 1st, and this is all looking at May 1st through the prior years, um, our storage level is lowest it's been since um, we've had the, the system that we have today. So again, putting it in context, this is for us, um, the, uh, in 40 years, we've never been in this position. So what have we been doing in mid-February? Our board um, really took proactive action hoping for a wet spring, which we didn't get, but hoping, but planning for not and asking our customers to voluntarily conserve water um, because it was dry through most of the um, rest of February into March and April. 
the board on April 20th, our board declared a water shortage emergency and adopted water use restrictions. And this past Tuesday, our board of directors approved additional restrictions, mostly around irrigation, and I'll touch on these. So our goal system-wide is a 40% in overall water use, and that's, that's big. That's a big ask, and it's going to take a lot of work, and it is going to have impacts, and we understand that. Um, we're asking to limit spray irrigation to two days a week. For folks that may not know, the demand, the use in our system doubles, slightly more than doubles in the summer compared to winter. And all of that is attributed to irrigation. And lawns certainly take the dominant use. Drip irrigation would be limited to three days a week. We're requiring covers for pools and spas, asking folks not to wash their vehicles at home. On our website, or um, we're identifying car washes that recycle their water and it's much more efficient asking folks not to power wash homes or businesses or wash their driveways. If you do water, don't do it during the heat of the day, do it between 7 p.m. and early morning. It's far more efficient. Um, all garden hoses that are being used need shut off nozzles. Um, you are not allowed to have water running off into the curb. Leaks have to be fixed. We're significantly restricting golf course irrigation and other uses of potable water. Essentially, we're trying to ask folks, right, just use it for the bare necessities at this point. Our focus is on education. I mean, we can put forth these restrictions and ask our customers to comply with them, but that's not who we are. We aren't water cops and we don't have the resources even if we want it to be, which we don't. This is really a call for the community to come together and save this resource, this precious resource, um, given where we are and the uncertainty of what the coming wet season may be. Um, we do have a bit of a stick in terms of violations and enforcement that we hope we won't need. And there's a lot of information on our website that I'd urge folks to look at. In terms of education, tremendous amount of resources that we have available again on our website, you know, kind of no brainer things, turn sprinklers off if you don't need them and water by hand, which is the most efficient way. Um, ideally, get rid of your lawn and replace it with water efficient landscaping that's more aligned with the arid climate that we have here. There are smart irrigation controllers for those that would like to use them. Gray water is an area um, that's getting more use and I'll touch on a program we have to support our customers similar to rain barrels and cisterns to capture rainwater, checking for leaky toilets and faucets. You know, it's interesting. All of these are very small individually in terms of savings, but collectively, it, it really does make a difference. Um, please, you know, don't be hosing off driveways and sidewalks with a hose. And if you see someone doing it, help us educate folks water efficient fixtures and aerators and simple things, you know, brushing, you know, water while you brush your teeth, shorter showers. One of the biggest indoor waste of water is waiting for that hot water to come on in the shower. And many people are going back. Some people have been doing it continuously. You put a bucket under there and then you use that water to flush your toilet or to uh, water your plants. So we're available and waiting and we're getting a lot of calls, but we have capacity to handle as many that come in to help navigate our customers through all of the incentives we have, all the programs we have to support our customers. Specifically, our board just increased the incentive for replacing um, high water use lawns and landscaping. 
um, $3 per square foot rebate we're offering or um, a free mulching service will come out there and have a nonprofit mulch your lawn and cap your sprinklers for replanting once the drought's over. We have controller rebates, a number of them, high efficiency clothes washer rebate. We have a rebate and a set of instructions and uh, webinars. If you're interested in gray water laundry to landscape, it's great. It doesn't work for everyone, but where it does, um, 50 cents per gallon rebate of rain barrels and cisterns. Um, this is very attractive um, for folks that want data on their water use. It's a rebate for a flume that just straps on your water meter, connects to your Wi-Fi, and you'd have an app. Um, North Marin, as you'll hear, they have um, the newer technology system-wide, so you don't need that there, um, where everyone can access that information. We do have it in our capital plan. We haven't gotten there yet. This hot water recirculation system is really a novel idea. I haven't seen this sort of device, but you put it under a sink, you turn it on and the hot water will be there ready when you're ready to take the shower so you don't have to run the water and waste it. And also a rebate on pool covers, understanding that that'll be an impact for folks. We have signs for anyone that wants to put them up, brochures, again, tremendous amount of information. You can see the number to give us a call, go to our website, and we're just very anxious to help out and share what everyone can do in this time of emergency, this time of water shortage that we're in. So thank you and thanks for the opportunity to share our message. Ryan, I believe you're up. Thanks, Ben. Um, Alan, do you want to uh, pop up the PowerPoint for me? Let me stop share. And I just wanted to thank all the participants. It looks like about 77 people. I, I don't see who you are, but uh, I'm sure I maybe know some of you. And it's, I'm glad you came to listen to us talk today and be happy to answer any of your questions afterwards. Uh, go to the next slide. I'm a water conservation coordinator with North Marin Water District. I've been in the water district about 22 years. Um, just going to give you a little overview on the district and our current supply. Obviously, the reasons why we're in this situation. Uh, talk about some things we've done uh, with our uh, restrictions, and then also some other things we've done to kind of um, deal with supply um, in general. So our water district, we're a little bit smaller than municipal, a little less than a third in our Novato service area. We do have a Westman service area. It's separately uh, funded in water supply area. Uh, for the purposes of today's talk, I'm focusing more on, on Novato, uh, but the restrictions placed out there, which were actually in place last year, are very similar. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions at the end or offline if you have specific to West Marine questions. Next slide. And so our, our water uh, portfolio of supply, we have about 21% coming from our local supply of Stafford Lake. Uh, our biggest supply, 66% roughly coming from the Russian River supply. And then uh, uh, our, our kind of emerging portfolio of water is in the recycled water field. And that's 13%. Uh, mainly in the summertime. So next slide. We have about 20,645 20, connections, about 61,000 people. Um, our, our water demand kind of pre the previous drought was about 9,800 uh, acre feet. Last year was about 8,000. So you're still seeing kind of declining uh, um, water use um, from the last drought as well. Next slide. So this year, you know, like I say, we have Stafford Lake. Um, here's a photo. It doesn't really show how low it is, but uh, we were able to backfeed a little bit, which I'll I'll talk in in a minute. But uh, scroll to the next side. The real driver in um, is just the rainfall, and I don't think you need to dwell on this. Ben kind of went over. Uh, you know, it's just historic low rainfall levels, and it's resulting in you know water supply issues for for both water districts. Uh, scroll to the next slide. <clears throat> And so right now, Stafford Lake is at about 54%. And um, 
it was even lower than that, but we, we did uh, do some backfeeding from surplus Sonoma County water supply, which I'll mention a little bit later. Next, next slide. Uh, our, our, you know, our, our biggest supply does come from the Russian River, though, and that kind of drives our water shortage situation. Um, you know, they have had historic low rainfall levels as well, both in the Santa Rosa area and the Ukai area, which kind of feeds the Lake Mendocino. Uh, next slide. It's so resulting in water supply, um, you know, of Lake Sonoma at about 61%, Lake Mendocino at about 43 and uh, so there's some action being taken at this time. Go to the next slide. You can see a little bit of Lake Sonoma at this time. It's, it's looking pretty low. Uh, it's still got a decent amount of supply um, in, in, in general, I guess, but uh, you know, action has to be taken at this time. And so that kind of leads into our drought actions to the next slide and the, the next one. Um, so we have, like I say, limited staff for Lake Supply. We have both delivery impacts, um, from Lake Mendocino and from Lake Sonoma. And next one. We've taken these drought related actions. We backfed Stafford Lake this winter with surplus Sonoma County water supply to kind of take water in the winter here when, and, and then use it in the summer produced from the lake. Uh, Sonoma County Water Agency has also taken action to uh, reduce flows out of Lake Mendocino and Lake Sonoma. And, uh, Point of record, this is like the first time that they have asked for flow reduction out of Lake Sonoma. And that is gonna result in this 20% diversion reduction mandate from the Russian River. And it's kind of therefore triggered our actions in this water shortage emergency period. Next slide. So our timeline, you know, we, we came out in January and February with a winter ad campaign, <clears throat> forming the customers of the dry air conditions. In March of 2021, March 16th, we approved a water conservation ordinance for uh, 41 for Nevada. Incidentally, we also approved an amended ordinance for West Marin, which is ordinance 39. Um, and then in April, um, we brought back to the board um, an amended ordinance 41 that set the conservation levels It enacted water use prohibitions and uh, suspended new connections to the system. Next slide. So the current mandates are 20% voluntary from May 1st to June 30th and mandatory from July 1st to November 1st and really to be achieved by uh, similar remembrance so through water waste and water use prohibitions. There's no uh, individual ration on someone's bill. Uh, next slide. So real quick, a lot of the pro prohibitions are very similar. Gutter flooding, you know, overspray and runoff from your lawns has to be eliminated. Uh, or spray irrigation, uh, failure to fix leaks. We need leaks fixed within, uh, um, uh, I think we say 72 hours. Uh, we try to be uh, reasonable with that, maybe, maybe earlier. This one is where we differ a little bit with municipal. We have a restriction on refilling drain or filling new swimming pools after July 1st, whereas they have a pool cover um, requirement. Uh, washing down exterior paved areas, uh, uh, very similar. Um, this other one is where we differ a little bit washing vehicles. We do allow with a shutoff nozzle uh, with minimal runoff, You're supposed to use a bucket. Um, and then the biggest one uh, for, for our water district and differs just slightly from our municipal is that we want our overhead sprinkler irrigation uh, restricted to three days a week. So odd addresses are assigned Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and even addresses assigned Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And those customers um, using over 300 gallons per day, by the way, I have to maintain a 20% reduction from 2020. However, you know, we're not looking at that percentage reduction unless we've identified that customer as maybe violating one of the other prohibitions. And we also have a similar uh, time window of irrigating uh, from, from uh, 7 p.m. to 9 a.m. And um, like I said, that lower end threshold is 300 gallons per day. Drip and hand watering is not restricted uh, to the days per week. Um, so next slide. So just some real uh, managing supply, go to the next one. So we've taken some actions to manage our supply in the bath. Obviously our comprehensive water conservation programs, very similar offerings to Marine Municipal. Um, uh, we've expanded our recycled water system, you know, in, in preparation for droughts. And then we have this uh, uh, AMI system that we've installed and so all of our customers in the Novato service area have a, um, essentially advanced meter where they can retrieve hourly data. They can, I'll talk a little bit more about, about uh, each of those. 
And we do also have a flume rebate program for our Westmoreland customers, very similar to the program that Ben had mentioned. And uh, so I wanted to go to the next slide, please. So our water conservation programs, uh, we recently did increase most of the rebate levels um, as of May 1st for indoor of the, the standard programs, um, toilet rebates, clothes wash rebates, hot water circulation, and we do give away uh, free fixtures, uh, shower heads, sink aerators, et cetera. Our, our main effort though outdoors really is our cash for grass program. We're really trying to target you know, removing those, uh, certainly front lawns. We try to get rid of as many front lawns as possible and wanted incentive. We recently increased that incentive. Um, and then we do, if customer wants to keep their lawn or keep their landscape in the way they have it, we offer other rebates for the smart irrigation controllers, um, landscape rebates for drip conversions and, and mulch installations, uh, pool cover rebates, uh, gray water rebates, rainwater catchment rebates, et cetera. And just of note, you know, our cash for gas program, we've been doing it quite a while. We've we've uh, removed the equivalent of 19 football fields of, of irrigated, automatically irrigated turf from our service area. So the next slide. Our uh, recycled water program is really, uh, um, we've really accelerated in that. We, we started with Stone Tree Golf Course in 2007 as solely watered with recycled water. Uh, in 2012, we expanded in the North Service Area from Novato Sanitary to the Fireman's Fund uh, campus. And that was kind of our anchor uh, location. Also Valley Memorial Cemetery. And then we uh, reached all other large landscape uh, customers on that path. Uh, in 2016, we, oh, excuse me, in the South area, we, we extended recycled water from Las Galinas Valley Sanitation District. And that primarily serves the large irrigation users in the Hamilton area. Uh, in 2016, we expanded uh, into what we call the central service area for recycled water from Novato Sanitary again. And that anchor customer was Marin Country Club. So now they are on recycled water for their uh, golf course irrigation. And um, we uh, connected to a lot of large landscapes along the way, including all of Vintage Oaks landscaping, uh, the hospital landscaping, um, a series of, I think, 10 HOAs along the way, and a lot of city median and landscaping. Now in 2021, we have over 90 plus customers um, uh, on recycled water for irrigation, and we actually have three car washes as well. Next slide. Uh, one of the biggest things that we've done in, uh, since the last drought, the 2014 through 16 period, is we have installed this advanced meter and infrastructure system. And gives the customer uh, well, in the water district, uh, you know, hourly intervals of water use uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it allows the customer and the water district, we have two different, we have the water district has a dashboard uh, version um, to analyze and look at the water use. The customer has a portal and in that portal, they can see their water use. Um, they can set leak and high use alerts and other um, alerts to communicate with them when their system may be um, in more water than they had intended. Um, you know, and it kind of it kind of changes the game a little bit because previously, 60 day billing period, you you only had water use records six times per year, uh, essentially, and um, and now you and so you could have a leak or or be using water um, at a high level for you know sometimes 60 days, and by the time you get the bill, maybe 70 days, and uh, you would be alerted to. It. Whereas now you the water district and the customer is alerted at a much um, accelerated rate and we're you know it's, it's been able to eliminate a lot of these really high bills that customers had where they had a leak or a malfunction irrigation controller etc so um next slide um it was just with any questions um the, these are the numbers to contact um contact us at if you uh, and, and just kind of wanted to reiterate what what ben said our programs are intended to educate the customer and uh, and although we have these prohibitions, we, we really want to work with the customer to make those corrections if they identify, identified as violating. So feel free to let us know um, if you've seen any, um, any issues. And, and we, we really like to work with that customer because honestly, most people don't know their, um, most of the people that we deal with don't want to waste water. They don't know they're wasting water or, or not adhering to one of the prohibitions. And um, it's sometimes good for us to let them know and, and, and start that conversation and get those things rectified. So uh, with that, um, we'll maybe open it up to questions. 
Okay, well, we definitely have questions. And um, my hunch is we're not going to get through them all <laughs> because we've got so many. So I appreciate, uh, Ryan, you're giving your, your phone number there for follow-up questions, and we can post that on the screen later on as well toward the end of the program so people can write that down if they missed it. Uh, but if we don't get through everything in the next, you know, 40, 50 minutes here, um, then, then uh, I, I, I know these gentlemen will do their best to try to uh, answer questions uh, apart from the program here. Let me start with a question from Paul Primo. Paul asks, are each of your, are each of your districts looking seriously at desalinization? If so, what is the status? If not, why are they not? Have you considered a joint district single desal program? And what would be the status of that? Well, I'll uh, start if that works, Ryan. Yeah, I think um, so. <clears throat> um, yeah, desal, we're certainly close to the bay and there's opportunities. And folks may know that Marin Municipal um, spent quite a long time looking into desal and developed a project. And ultimately the rains came and the project never moved forward. Um, th there's challenges with desal. I mean, um, the one, it's very, very expensive from capital costs to build, but maybe even more so the challenge is the operating expense. It takes a tremendous amount of energy I won't get into the, the technical aspects to it, but it's a very, very energy dominant operation. So you're contributing, of course, to greenhouse gases and the like. It's a very high expense and it, it's not the best approach for a um, kind of drought standby because you're building all that money and you're probably not operating it um, very frequently. Um, that said, we're looking at all options and working to build our water resiliency in a number of ways. And desal is in the mix. It's just probably not the leading candidate due to the issues I noted. Anything to add, Brian, on that? Yeah, I would agree with uh, with Ben. And, and uh, the cost is, is 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 extreme for that that water supply. And uh, but you know, like Ben said, it's it's an option. I'm sure North Marin um, through the resiliency study, you know, looking at that as an option to participate with Marin Municipal. But the it is cost prohibitive in some ways. Okay. Um, the next question we have is uh, on a specific topic, which I'm sure is going to come up uh, a fair bit, so you might already have encountered this. Uh, Maria Cesaretti, Cesaretti, excuse me, I think I'm saying that right. Maria Cesaretti asks, I've signed a contract to have a rental home painted before water restrictions were announced. The contract scope of work calls for power washing. The contractor told me that this is still okay to, to, do, to do. The work really needs to be done. This will be an expensive paint job and good prep is mandatory. So are we allowed to do this power washing at this time? So I, I can speak for Marin Municipal. We do have in our prohibitions with this drought, no power washing. We've designed and developed a variance process to address the many, many um, unique circumstances that couldn't be anticipated, maybe one-offs, maybe have unusual impacts. And this sounds like a contract that was signed before um, would be, you know, a likely one to submit a variance um, and have that reviewed. Of course, we would ask folks to delay um, the painting of the house if the customer could, but Otherwise, I think it's, you know, a reasonable candidate for the variance process. And that probably holds to a number of unique circumstances of the folks that are out there um, today. Yeah, and, and for North Marin, we, we don't specifically uh, prohibit it. Um, I, I guess to an extent we do allow it, but they can't have any runoff from the property onto the other a neighbor's property or, or to a, um, 
the driveway or curb and gutter. They need to retain that water on the property. I don't know if it's as much water, you know, as, as some people think, but the audible sound of a pressure washer uh, really kind of invokes um, uh, a response from your neighbors. And so <laughs> we usually hear about it, but uh, we also have a variance procedure as well and um, uh, very similar to municipal, but we don't specifically prohibit uh, painting of the house to pre uh, prepping the house um, uh, to paint. And so for for each of your districts, um, the the variance request might be slightly different, or it might be a different uh, exemption that they're seeking. But is the is the process similar? What what do they do? They come in and they fill out a form. Yeah. So for us, um, it can be all online. They would see the um, process laid out pretty clearly right on our web page and that would be reviewed. And then there's also a prescribed appeal process depending on the determination of the variance. And what we do think the vast majority of issues will be and can be resolved through that. Um, we are you know, asking folks to try and do what they can, but um, it's certainly open to folks. Okay, good. Um, let me move on. We have a question from Carson Anderson. Uh, I am the president of a small HOA in San Rafael. We were recently notified of a very late, uh, excuse me, we were recently notified very late of a huge water bill on one of our two electric meters. Uh, MMWD sent a notification by mail to our HOA administrator who in turn called me. So my questions are one, why does MMWD not have an early warning system when an account uh, spikes astronomically? You've referred to this earlier, so you can pick up on that. Uh, a simple phone call here could have saved a lot of water and a lot of money. And question two, after a, de a detailed search of MMWD's website, I found under quote resources that anyone with a smart meter can get an app called Eye on Water that records usage immediately. It would seem to me that MMWD's communications department should make all users with smart meters aware of that app tool to help conservation in this drought uh, as, we, as well as trying to stop leaks early. So it sounds like for you, Ben. Yeah, I think the, um, th the nature of what we have in place is we do meter reads, manual meter reads once every two months. So we don't have the ability to do that kind of early notification. Now, North Marin has put in, and Ryan can speak for himself and his agency, an automated system, automated meter infrastructure that has more tools along those lines. Um, we are offering, as I noted in my presentation, incentives for people to install this flume device that would give them the app and essentially the same uh, tools to monitor their use and be alerted if they get a spike. Um, we are hopeful in our capital plan over the next five years or so that we do um, install automated meter infrastructure um, it's a cost like everything else. It'll probably cost us around $20 million, but that would be a benefit generally for our customers and certainly in times of drought. Okay, we have a question here from Jim Cole. I'm assuming this refers to HOAs or, or uh, multifamily uh, developments. His question is, Will there be water restrictions or are there water restrictions now on development-wide irrigation systems that are not tied to an individual homeowner's usage? Um, yes, our restrictions, and it's likely similar um, in North Marin, apply to all irrigation of landscaping. So whether it's a homeowner, commercial, institutional, ball field, open space parks. We're asking that all of those are held to the same standard of two days a week of irrigation for spray irrigation. And for us, three days a week if you're on drip. So the short answer I believe is yes. 
Same, same for North Marin. It's all customers. Okay, good to know that clarification. Richard Harris has a series of questions, and I, I think they're discrete, so I'll read them all, but um, uh, I think they're, they're three different topics. Rationing water is a prima facie evidence of an insufficient supply of water for human consumption, sanitation, and fire protection. Furthermore, the, the 2007 countywide plan projects insufficient water under both normal and drought scenarios. How can you in good conscience continue to offer water connections to new construction under such circumstances? What, um, why don't we start with that and then I'll read the, the next one in a minute. Sure, I'll, I'll take a cut at that. that um, the, um, we aren't yet rationing water certainly, but that could happen where we get to a rationing point. Um, I, I do want to know that this is historic, this drought by any measure, so um, that needs to be remembered, although we all know the county does repeatedly get in droughts, but this one's particularly historic. Um, as a water purveyor, we aren't involved in planning um, development and growth. That, of course, happens at the local jurisdictions with planning commissions and the like. Um, so our job is to provide the water, um, not wade into the planning. Of course, there's an obvious nexus there that I understand and appreciate. And our board will be looking at um, what to do with new connections going forward during this drought period. So we've begun talking about that and that discussion's continuing. Okay, uh, oops, there I am. Uh, the the follow-up questions unrelated, I guess, and I'll read both of these. You are required to calculate the amount of money, I'm sorry, the amount of water necessary for fire suppression. What is that number and how is it calculated? And then lastly, Marin Sanitation releases millions of gallons of recycled water into the bay each day. Why are we not using that water to recharge our reservoirs? As you know, Okaquan River Reservoir has been doing so for more than 30 years with no adverse consequences. If California law doesn't permit such a process, why are we not trying to change the law? Okay, the, um, my understanding is the um, fire departments are responsible in terms of assuring the adequacy of, for fire supply in terms of the lines, the pressures, um, the number of hydrants, and they do that. And we work in partnership to upsize where they need it based on their calculations and their analysis. Um, the primary role of a water district is supplying water for potable purposes, but of course, firefighting is a critical um, activity that does pull from our demand, but generally that's managed by the fire professionals um, that look at that. Um, I think the other question was related to water recycling and the wastewater that goes into the bay. And Ryan talked about their water recycling program in North Marin, and we have one as well. Um, the, the, these are very complicated projects, um, particularly in an area like Marin that's not very dense and doesn't have high industrial users that create cost effectiveness in sending is basically putting in the distribution system is what's so costly. And, you know, the, there are models out there, new developments in Las Vegas, as they're putting the development in, probably puts in a third um, line for, with recycled water. Um, th that's a challenge. And a lot of this does come down for, to resources and relative priorities. All right, moving along. Brant Miller asks, is Sulahula not a part of Marin water? 
it is not on Mount Tam. Right. That that that's a uh, good correction to my comments talking about all of our lakes on M Mount Tam. Sulahuli is our newest reservoir, and it's in West Marin. Um, it, it's not actually on the mountain, but it is part of our overall storage and supply system. Yes. Okay. We we, we built that reservoir following a number of actions following the drought in the 70s. And that was one we took, which actually allows us to be in a much better condition than we were back then, even though we've had less rainfall. Greg Nell asks, uh, he asks you to use your crystal ball here, I think. Is the drought long-term? Does climate change have a role in permanently making Marin a drier region than it has been historically? Yeah, that's um, a, a very complicated question. And I think folks understand that generally um, predicting the weather next week, right? Never mind predicting what the weather is going to look like years out. Um, I do think there's a growing consensus, and it may be obvious to folks, of looking at the past. 100 years is probably not the best prediction of the future given climate change. We are working with professionals and uh, people in Stanford to try and help understand through climate models what the future may look like. Generally, it seems to be um, less storms, but more intense. Um, and frankly, it looks if it holds that way, we may be in a better position than people that rely on the snowpack and really, because for us, it's that local supply here in Marin, but it, it is very, very uncertain what things will look like. And even prior to climate change, if you look in the very long history, the, there were periods of extended droughts as bad or worse than this that went on for years. So. The, you know, um, anything is possible and our job as water professionals is to work with our customers on conservation, um, hope for the best, support our customers, but plan for um, this coming wet season to be on the dry side so we can keep the water flowing, of course. And on that point of working with the customers, uh, Jamie Ellerman asks, it seems like people who listen to these kinds of seminars and read your flyers are those who are already concerned and already conserving. Do you ever look at individual total usage and proactively contact those specific individuals whose water use is well above average for the area, perhaps either to offer a water audit on the pretext that they may have a leak or at least to let them know what the situation, let them know that the situation is dire and that their neighbors are all conserving, but they seem to be falling short. Yes, we do have some um, very high water users in our service area. And generally um, those are homes with expansive lawns that are kept lush and green. And during the drought, we are gonna be working with them to reduce their usage. And for everyone we're asking, right? Sprinkler irrigation two days a week, we'll be talking with our high water users a bit more directly on what they need to do, what we're gonna be asking them to do and monitoring to ensure that they really are bringing their water use down. So this, this um, next question from Phil Halstein uh, relates a little bit to some remarks you made a few minutes ago. Um, you might have already covered this therefore, but if you wanna amplify, I'll, I'll read it. I believe in the actions that MMWD Marin Water have been taking, declaring restrictions, building up on the overall system and communicating well. If we're to have a dramatically, if we're to dramatically conserve with current residents, how can we possibly have enough water for additional housing, which is being required by the state? How will Marin Water and the city of San Rafael reconcile these competing demands? We can anticipate that this drought will continue, right? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the last piece is hard to anticipate. I do expect our board and we will be um, talking with them to think about during the drought, what to do with new connections from um, status quo to landscape restrictions and other restrictions, net zero, all the way to a moratorium that we've done in the past. Um, the, I, I just do wanna emphasize the development and land use. We are not a land use agency. Um, our job is to bring water to the community and that's what we're focused on. But I do appreciate um, the nexus of growth and water and understand the concern. And we absolutely will be continuing to work with our local jurisdictions. Okay, uh, you've, you've spoken about the, the flume monitor. Um, I don't know if you wanna amplify in response to this question from one of the listeners. Can, can you please talk about the flume monitor, its effectiveness and how they can help with large scale distribution? Anything to add? Um, yeah, so I don't fully understand the large scale distribution if someone wants to follow up directly with us on that, but the flume device is um, relatively inexpensive, particularly with the rebate we're offering. And it is um, relatively simple to install. And I say that because I'm able to install it and I'm not too mechanically inclined. And it connects, you strap it right on your water meter and it connects to your Wi Fi. And you have an app that you know day-to-day, hour-to-hour, how much your water consumption is. And it really is, it's about data because it really gives people a tool to understand, okay, when I turn on my sprinklers and you start to appreciate how much water goes to your lawn relative generally and how much you use inside. So I think it's one of the best things out there. Again, it fits better in the Marin Municipal uh, service area in Nor North Marin. I don't believe you would need it because they do have the automated meter infrastructure where I believe you can have that information through other means. Uh, next question is about um, whether or not your agencies will be posting frequent updates and progress reports on uh, achieving the water goals that you've been announcing. How, how often will we expect to see um, reports on how we're doing? Yeah, that's absolutely critical. And our board has been very clear that they want us to come up with a strategy and approach and a plan of how we're going to do just that. So our communications folks and others have developed some nice graphics of where we are compared to our goal, how every week. So what we're expecting every week to update on our website to work with our media partners to get out the information so people can track um, the success or the limited success wherever it falls, hopefully the former in terms of conservation and also um, help folks understand if we do need to make put on additional restrictions, why? So likely that would be, we just are not meeting our goal so we're going to be taking additional action. So um, it's a key. This is all about communication. And I, I do agree with one of the questions that came that the folks on this call are here because you're interested and you're most likely doing the right thing or inclined to do the right thing. My job, our job is to get the word out to the entire community, including residents that just aren't engaged or as engaged as folks on this call or similar may be. Makes sense. Um, Robert McCaskill makes the question, uh, makes the observation that uh, given the history of water shortages and the risk of global warming, uh, isn't it time for Marin Water to expend more funds as soon as possible to increase access to more water? And, and a related question from Steve Barlow is, uh, is the Richmond Bridge viaduct feasible? And if so, when? Yeah, the, um, what we, uh, 
I, I'd love if we everyone wants to give us, um, you know, some more revenues. It's always a challenge, of course, increasing rates because water's gotten expensive, and we understand that the service that we provide and. Um, we're over 100 years old, as I noted in my presentation, and we're starting to show our age in our infrastructure. So there's a tremendous amount of competing demands. That said, absolutely no question, water supply is front and center, it's core business. So we're going to do what we need to do, and we are looking at a range of options. Um, in terms of the pipe on the bridge, um, the actual physical pipe is um, the visible indication. It's a project that's far more complicated. The pipe on the bridge gets the water from the East Bay to us. Um, we also need to find a source of water that has become very difficult with the drought um, as farmers and others in the state water projects in Central Valley have been curtailed on their water rights. And then we have to move the water we find to get it to a point we can pump it across on the bridge. So I'd say at this point, we're looking at the feasibility. Um, there's also the lane where we had laid the pipe back in the 70s and now that's the multi-use or bike lane, whatever it's called. Um, so where we put the pipe and we're going to be working with Caltrans on the structural integrity of the bridge. But remember, um, the bridge is just one piece of it. We do have to find the water and then we do have to move it potentially through a number of other agencies to ultimately bring it to us. So it, it's far from far from a given that we'd be able to do that and that will bail us out, which is why we're so focused on conserving every drop of water today. Because once that water is used up, right, there's no more capturing it. Somewhat of a different tack here. Hans Schmidt has a question. Why do we need two water districts in Marin? Wouldn't a combined district be more efficient? Never heard that before, have you? Yeah, you know, so um, I, I would just say not to deflect the answer, but obviously that's um, a bit out of my pay grade. That's a good political discussion. Um, what we have these two, you know, there's a couple smaller water districts in the county, but a handful. Um, on the wastewater side, there's many, many more. And, you know, these things just build up over time in certain ways. And um, I, I think on the water side, it, um, in my view, it works pretty effectively. Um, and we're able to collaborate and bounce ideas off each other and really work together. So um, I, I don't see in my role that there's an issue there. I understand the perception of if you combine, you're going to have one general manager and save a bit of overhead or something like that. And I, I'm not judging that one way or another, but um, I, th I think um, on the water side, it works pretty effectively. So I know you've, you've touched on this, but we've got a number of questions on uh, the uh, the topic of recycling water and, and having um, either gray water systems or dual water systems, uh, one for irrigation, one uh, yeah, irrigation and toilets, one for drinking water. And uh, I know you've also talked about the, the scale and, and the efficiency and critical mass on that. Um, but it, it, it's a question that seems to be keep, that keeps uh, coming up in the audience questions. Anything else that we could hear from you as far as where we might be uh, in the future for that kind of a system? Yeah, so if we think about water recycling, there's maybe two scales to think about. One is at the home, and that's really moving towards gray water, and that's taking your laundry water and ultimately moving to where we're able to even collect water from showers and using that for irrigation. 
And these, uh, some of these systems are complicated. There's more and more work being done. In some instances, if you have a washer that's close to an exterior wall, it's actually almost a do-it-yourself sort of project. Um, and we offer kits and training on that. So the residential scale is one approach. And certainly that's the most efficient because it's not going down the sewer to be treated and then pumped back. Um, the second is the larger scale water recycling projects that Ryan and I were talking about. And those, just to give you a feel of replacing a mile of water pipes or putting in, it's somewhere in the range of 1.5 to $2 million. So if you think about putting an entire new network in, not only is it really a daunting and completely dominating capital expense, but you're also now creating a legacy of one more piping infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And so many of us are trying to catch up to the deficit we have. But, you know, that said, it, it's a great way to conserve water and water is water. And I think on this question or an earlier one, there was recognition where the industry is going, which is direct potable reuse. I think in Marin, we're probably um, not there yet um, in terms of really thinking about it seriously, but in the South Bay, um, in many parts of the country and world, right? Astronauts have been doing it forever of taking the wastewater and treating it to a level and putting that directly into your water supply. And then you don't need that infrastructure in place. Um, of course, there's a lot of education and public perception issues, but we do have test beds around the country that are moving in that direction that we'll all be able to learn from. Scott, okay. I just wanted to add, and just real quick, wanted to add, we, we do require, I saw some of those questions on, on the chat, and, uh, you know, we do require our new connections, uh, if reasonably, feasibly located near our recycled water to have that for their irrigation. And we found that most, most of our new construction, we've been able to connect the landscaping to the recycled water. Um, and so that that is a requirement. The other thing I saw a lot of questions about new houses, we require that. The new development has is is we require way more efficiency standards, even on potable for landscape installations and indoor fixtures. We're municipal as well. These new places coming in are pretty efficient. Not a lot of lawns going in. If the lawns are going in, they're usually on actually they're on recycled water. We you know we don't allow lawns in commercial development without the use of recycled water. So anyway, I saw a lot of those questions aimed at that and. Um, you know, recycled water is meant to be used as, as much as we can get any new construction or existing customer on that for their landscaping or car washes. Okay, good to know. Um, there was a point made earlier that uh, the, the regulation between your two agencies differs slightly in terms, well, significantly, I guess, in terms of car washes, that they are prohibited in um, uh, the Marin water uh, territory, as I understand it, but permitted uh, in North Marin as long as the hose has a nozzle shutoff. Uh, first of all, am I right about that? And secondly, um, why can't we in, in uh, the Marin water zone um, follow the, the protocol that they use in North Marin and wash our cars as long as we have a, a water shutoff on the hose? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a fair question. Um, I'd say probably both of us um, would suggest that um, riding around in a dirty car during this time of historic drought is the right thing to do. <laughs> um, but for folks that choose not to do that, we're asking them to use a car wash that recycles the water. I think what North Marin's doing is reasonable as well. Um, but, you know, every drop, you know, you wash your car in your driveway, even if you're using minimal amounts with a 
that has a shutoff nozzle, you, you are having water typically run down the driveway into the curb um, that, that's wasting water during this time of historic drought where we need to save every single drop. Fair point. And I would add, um, there are non-water methods for washing cars. Um, I use a, a product that's a, it's called a spray detailer or auto detailer that you can buy at almost any uh, auto parts store or even hardware stores. And you spray it on and you wipe your car off. You got to be careful not to scratch your car if it's too dirty, but um, that is an alternative. Um, I'm going to keep going unless you guys tell me that you've got to go. We still have a lot of questions from the audience and I want to get in as many as we can here because people definitely want, want to know what's going on. Uh, and so just give me a signal, you guys, if, if, uh, if we're running late on your schedules. Josh Labresco says, over the 25 years that I've lived in San Rafael, I've seen that MMWD's RADA rates are consistently much, much higher than the rates in Novato. Rates in Southern Marin may even be the highest in the Bay Area, not sure. Why are MMWD's rates so high? Yeah, um, well, it depends who we compare to. I would say um, part of the reason I, I'm surmising here that Novato may be a bit less is it may be a newer community that doesn't have um, the age of facilities that we have. So much of our resources are going into renewal and upgrades of our system. Um, around the Bay Area, another unique aspect of our service area at Marin Municipal is the nature of the geography with all the hills and valleys create the need for much more infrastructure than you would find in other areas that have more flat topography. So we need more tanks, we need more pumping stations, we have a tremendous amount of pressure zones. And then, you know, if you're in a dense area like San Francisco or Oakland, right, one stretch of pipe is able to feed uh, water to tens of thousands of people, where for us, it's maybe feeding it for hundreds. So the extent of our infrastructure relative to our population, unfortunately, is, or is multiple times what the typical water district is in the Bay Area or elsewhere. All right. Um... Question here from Joseph Riley. What about banning grass athletic fields and watering lawns? Well, you talked about the lawns, but I guess athletic fields would be a different different question. Yeah, I mean, the, that has come up and I know many athletic fields converted to artificial turf, some converted back. Um, there's, you know, issues maybe with injuries and other things of concerns with artificial turf. Um, so, you know, the, the, the challenge, but we all have our challenges, but in this business is how do we steer folks um, to do the right thing in terms of using water at the same time, you know, people and communities are going to make choices. Um, so, the athletic fields that are heavily utilized may be viewed by some as different than front yards, as Ryan noted, um, that um, aren't, don't have the same level of function. So they aren't functional grass in the way um, ball fields are. But, um, you know, if, if you go and many people, right, have visited, um, the other areas of the arid west, whether it's Vegas or New Mexico, and you know, you, you don't see the sort of landscaping we have, never mind in Europe, that uses far less water in the countries in the Mediterranean climate. So they really have adapted 
probably a bit more um, than we have in terms of aligning their lifestyles and landscaping consistent with the climate. Okay, we have a couple questions again back to desalinization. Penny Wells says, uh, asks, can solar power desalinization operations? And in a related question, Brock Phillips is asking, uh, I have no confidence that Marin will return to rainfall levels that were more common in the 20th century. It seems the long-term trend for the West is more and more arid. For that reason, I think we must find ways to replace lost supply due to less rain. Desalinization may be expensive, but perhaps it could be coupled with an aggressive solar or wind generation initiative to offset the energy cost. I realize it's a big engineering cost, but the alternative appears to be running out of water. Yes, the um, certainly solar and other renewable energy um, is in the cards if we were looking or when we're looking at desal. I, I do want to impress, um, I don't know the acreage, but it would be daunting. Um, it would be significant. It's probably not we're going to find local land to put enough solar to power a desal facility, which is so energy intensive. But um, it is is difficult to deny, and I wouldn't try to, that it appears that things are changing. Um, you know, you can't have a hurricane with a hundred year frequency coming every year and keep calling it a hundred year storm. We can't have these droughts coming every few years and saying, you know, they're historic in nature. So we do understand that and we're focused in the current drought, but also thinking about what the long term looks like and not to talk about grass and yards one more time, but it one reason our board is really focused on incentivizing and supporting people to get rid of their grass is once we do that, that's a demand. And for, for this community, conservation is by far the cheapest water supply, the most sustainable water supply. And it also provides benefits in terms of energy and costs of wastewater facilities and the like. So that really um, hopefully is first and foremost for our customers as it is for us but it doesn't mean whatsoever that we aren't looking at and analyzing and intend to pursue other um, aspects to increase our overall resiliency over the long term. This question from uh, Maria Yoam uh, goes back to the re reclaimed recycled water topic. Is Marin Water looking at providing a service where reclaimed water can be trucked to residents' homes to fill a water tank or a cistern so that reclaimed water can be used for irrigation and that means? Um, we aren't looking at that yet. What we are doing is um, looking to develop a residential recycled water station and I'm not sure if North Marin has it or is similarly developing it where customers could come on designated days and hours to pick up water. And I absolutely understand that that's going to work for some and not others because water is um, heavy. And, you know, you can only move and carry so much depending on the sort of trailer you have or you're putting it in gallon jugs in your trunk or whatnot. But we do want to provide that service for folks that are able to and interested to come pick it up for their home use. Um, in terms of um, putting a tank on your property and having someone come in and fill that up, um, I've heard, but I don't know any detail about it, that there may be some entrepreneurs that are looking at um, doing something like that. And hopefully if we find out, we'll be able to share that with folks. Okay, um, I'm gonna try and wrap it up here quickly, but let me get in a couple of more questions here. Um, 
Brent Miller asks, Monterey and San Diego both recycle sewage. What's the problem in Marin? Yeah, so we, again, we recycle um, North Marin as does Marin Municipal. We do recycle a fair portion of the sewage that's developed here. Um, there's more to go. Um, it is like all things, um, costly endeavors and you need the right projects. We, in fact, just put in a grant funding request to help offset the capital to bring a pipe out to a golf course. It's one of our high demand users and that's very attractive. And Ryan noted a cemetery, you know, those large places become anchors and then give you the cost effectiveness to bring a line that others can tee off of and utilize that recycled water. So it is certainly in the hopper and it's part of the broad portfolio. I don't think any of these single issues is a silver bullet, but it is about some measure of diversification and moving forward with water conservation being front and center. Okay, well, I think we're gonna wrap it here. We've, we've still got other questions that we didn't get to and I apologize for that. Uh, we, we had quite a bit of uh, audience interaction and just simply can't do everything in one session. But uh, our speakers have indicated that they'd be willing to entertain questions later on. Uh, I don't know if you wanna give your, your contact info again, uh, Ben and Ryan, or wh whether you'd like to have us put that on our website. This will be recorded, by the way, or is being recorded. And so the session will be available in our archives at Marin dot, uh, marincoalition.org. Uh, but we can also put your contact info on the site if you'd care to do that, or if you want to give it here, I'll leave that up to you. Well, why don't you just go ahead and put the contact I had on that last slide? That would be fine. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find that one. I've got I've got this one here that I will. Well, this is yeah, this is your slide. Let me share this. Screen share. Sorry, people. There it is. Is that the right one? That's the one. Okay. So if folks want to take down that information, that will get you to Ryan. And then um, Ben, what's what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, so our contact information was on the PowerPoint and I believe you'll be posting that on your website. So right. people, as soon as you post it, would be able to go directly to it, find our um, the right email and phone, or alternatively, just go to our main website, right on the main landing page is Drought and you're gonna get everything you need right there, including contact information for more details. Okay. Well, we really appreciate the time. I know there's a lot of public uh, questions and, and interest and concern as evidenced by the attendance here today and the level of questioning. So I appreciate everybody participating. I appreciate our speakers giving uh, the benefit of your wisdom on this and being available in the future as we go forward. So. Thank you all for that. I think this was a good sharing session and um, pray for rain. And in the meantime, let's do our best to, uh, to deal with the situation as I know we're doing. Uh, so let me just repeat. Th thank you, Scott, for your uh, introduction and your facilitation and to the Marin Coalition for the invite to help us get our message out. We really appreciate it. Our pleasure. And um, as you all know, we kind of put this into the schedule sort of slipped it in at the last minute because of the uh, the urgency of the situation. We, we did not want to wait for this one until uh, later on in the summer because people should be uh, undertaking their efforts now. And so that's why we rushed to get this on the schedule. And we were very gratified that we got these uh, excellent presenters to join us today. So thank you again, Ben. Thank you again, Ryan. Uh, our next two events, again, May 18 at 6 p.m., we will be doing the wildlife rehabilitation presentation, and then uh, Jared Huffman on June 2 at noon. Hope to see many of you there. Um, thank you all for joining us. I will leave it there, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.